Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Harin Bhadaria. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how you can use MySQL's component service infrastructure to extend MySQL and plug in a customized feature, which meets your need. And I will also showcase a toy component, which I developed to show how easy it is and how useful functionality you can provide using this infrastructure. So, you know, without um, further ado, let me just dive in. Um, so this is standard safe hour statement, uh, please treat this as information only. Um, right, so the, the main topic is how component infrastructure is better than MySQL's plugin architecture. So MySQL has been allowing uh, users, developers, customers to extend functionality provided by MySQL through plugin interfaces. Uh, plugins are predefined types, uh, which has hooks at various places within the server. Uh, there are predefined set of APIs registered with each plugin. And using these APIs, one can extend MySQL's functionality and provide something that's not there uh, by default or something which is specific to a user's own requirement. So to summarize what plugin infrastructure provides is, you have a MySQL server binary, which provides different plugin APIs. Um, and plugins will allow you to extend the functionality. Uh, if one plugin wants to talk to another plugin, there is something called plugin services. It's kind of uh, an infrastructure which is provided by MySQL server binary, which allows plugin to talk to each other and leverage on each other's functionality. However, there are two main drawbacks of MySQL's plugin infrastructure. Uh, while it's been there since long, probably 5.5 or 5.1, if I'm not wrong, um, there are only fixed plugin types. It is very difficult to extend plugin types because uh, a lot of plumbing work is required within the server binary itself to provide new types of plugin. And um, if if a user or if a developer is wants to do something which is not which was not there before, uh, the code changes can be quite substantial. So it's very difficult to extend. That was part one. Um, the part two is that plugin cannot directly talk to each other. There is an interface called plugin services, which basically is required. And it's sorts of act as a, you know, middleman. Uh, it has to be there. This plugin services are part of MySQL server binary, and they are very expensive in terms of, you know, performing operations. So, again, uh, depending on which plugin should talk to which other plugin, this plugin services needs to be extended as well. So introducing a new plugin type becomes a really, really challenging operation. Now, the MySQL plugin infrastructure is heavily used even internally by MySQL developers to provide functionality uh, in a way that the design is very modular. User has control over which all modules user can enable or disable. So whichever limitation applies uh, to a developer outside of MySQL applies to a developer within MySQL, probably manifold because, well, we have a rich set of MySQL plugins uh, available, and we want to add more and more modular functionality with predefined set of APIs. So we, so to, to basically uh, remove these limitations to have a better architecture, we have introduced uh, MySQL component infrastructure. In very basic term, you can treat MySQL component infrastructure as a kind of a consumer, producer consumer model, uh, it, which is a service or well, service oriented architecture to be specific. So we have a registry which basically serves as the hub of hub for both producer and consumer. Uh, a consumer can come into a registry and ask whether a particular type of service is available or not. Uh, you can define various services and defining a service is as simple as defining a header file, nothing more. Um, 
once a service is defined, there can be multiple implementation of a service. For example, if you can see in this diagram, service A has been implemented by uh, component foo, component bar, and component or well, I made a typo, it should say component bars. So three different components can implement same service, which means that, okay, if you have a functionality for, let's say, uh, password validation, uh, different customer or different developer can write their own way of doing password validation and provide the functionality on your own. Now, all these components are loaded to something called dynamic loader. It's it basically allows a shared library to uh, load its code uh, and you know attach itself with MySQL server, and it registers all this implementation with the registry. So the the components are producers of services, whereas if a consumer wants it, for example, on the left hand side of the uh, screen, you can see that uh, there is a consumer service which wants to use the service B. It can request service registry to provide a handle to an implementation which provides service B, in which case this is component bar. Uh, a consumer can also request an implementation, not just the service. So component consumer can say that I want an implementation A provided by, uh, you know, a particular component, let's say component foo, and uh, registry will return the handle to that, and you know, uh, it can be used by the consumer. So this is this is an overview of the MySQL component infrastructure. Now, as I say, this is a service-oriented architecture. The registry uh, for service discovery is a very lightweight process. It tries to minimize logs taken in order to search a service or to add a new service because this this can create a serious uh, you know uh, serious problems in terms of scalability and performance uh, there are no predefined or hard coded types so because of that it is very easy to extend and add new services so and and the key point is registry is type agnostic it doesn't care which type of services are stored with it each service is recognized by the name, that's all. So anyone can add new service and ask registry to provide a reference to an implementation which implements that service. So it becomes really easy. And this allows MySQL engineering team to create highly modular code, provide small uh, modules, small shared libraries, which can be optionally uh, you know, enabled at the time of my uh, with the MySQL server and provide little extra functionality needed, uh, you know, uh, by the user. And this is again, uh, since it's open source and it's available to everyone, everyone can use it and create their own component and provide, or well, they can create their own services for that matter and provide uh, the functionality. Now, a um, little bit of uh, terminology here. So, MySQL Server uses something called a persistent dynamic loader. Uh, this is important because it allows MySQL Server to uh, load a services across restart. So you just have to do an install component once. Once it is done, the path to that particular implementation is stored within MySQL Server. And then every time you restart, your component will be available for use. So that's called persistent dynamic loader, which interfaces with dynamic loader, which again, in turn, uh, you know, helps you load a service, load a component. Now, all this component, which are loaded by persistent dynamic loader are uh, registered with registry. So whosoever wants to consume this service can look up this services in registry and, um, you know, search for, search for it and ask for the handle to those things. So some example of the services are user-defined functions, uh, performance schema system variables, all these are implemented as services in MySQL now. Um, to, so, so this is how MySQL server binary looks now. So there is something called server component, which in, which in itself is a component within MySQL server binary. This component houses something called minimal chassis. Minimal chassis is nothing but the bare minimum blocks required to support the uh, MySQL component infrastructure. It comprises of service registry and dynamic loader, just the two things. And using this, 
Solo component provides certain services by default, for example, error logging, THD management, uh, query execution service, persistent dynamic loaders. All these services are part of the servo component and they are loaded with the help of minimal chassis. Not only this, once, sorry, not only this, uh, if any plugin or if any component is loaded alongside MySQL server, they can use this infrastructure, the infrastructure of minimal chassis, to ask for a different component or a different service and use them in itself. So we have made every attempt to make it more and more, uh, you know, easier and easier to use this infra. So even the plugins can request and use new component services. So it it makes transition from plugin to component easier. You can you can without really changing the code much, you can utilize new services in your plugin, and then at your own pace, you can uh, convert your plugin into a component. Uh, so let me just now talk about the how, how much service inventory we have. It's very mature now. We have 90 plus services with within MySQL, ranging from service registry to error logging, uh, services to get or set system variables, uh, security contracts creation or modification, password validation, uh, key rings, table access, and whatnot. And we are constantly adding to the service uh, repositories. We are constantly adding new components, new services types as we see fit when we are developing new modules within MySQL. And these are available for everyone to use and extend MySQL as they see fit. Some of the key uh, features that we have introduced recently are uh, keyring backends. Uh, MySQL used to provide keyring as a plugin, it still does, but we are now moving to a component based architecture because it provides much more flexibility. It allows the keyring backend to be used not only in MySQL server binary, but other binaries as well, because all they need to do is just support uh, component infrastructure, which is really, really lightweight, and they can use all these libraries. So Keyring backends allow access to keyring data, and uh, it it seamless. I mean, it seamlessly replaces our existing keyring plugin architecture. Uh, we also have a service which uh, allows you to set system variable values within the server. So, a component, if deemed fit, can set certain variables, and the behavior of server will change depending on the new value. Uh, we have something called a query attribute, which provides access to the query view of a running query. And uh, well, it, it needs to be called from within the server session. You know, when you're running the query, uh, it can read, let's say, a value from an UDF or an audit log event handler. It's pretty useful. Uh, the table access: uh, a component can read or write data directly to and from a table. Uh, you know, perform index scan, uh, handle the table structure, and whatnot. So it provides a good way for component to persist or change their own data if they require it. Now, um, right, so to demonstrate the power of this uh, component structure, I created a toy password validation component service, uh, which checks whether the password appears in any data breaches. Uh, so just a fair warning, this is for demonstration it's not production ready so if you are if you if you are looking at the code later on uh, you know uh, make sure that you are aware of consequences and you use it at your own risk so some some basic idea on how it works is so mysql server binary provides a password validation apis these apis are called when uh, a user is created uh, so at that time the password is supplied and we can check whether the password satisfied certain criteria uh, when a user's password is changed using alter user or set password, at that time, this API will be called to check whether the new password also satisfies the criteria. And uh, there are a set of functions provided which can let you know the strength of a password. So the password breach component that I'm demonstrating supports the password validation APIs. So it can be used when you are creating user or changing password of a user. In addition, it provides something called a password breach check function. It is over and above uh, the password validation API. It registers this function with the server. And if you provide your password, it goes checks. So 
Have I been pawned is a really good resource to know whether a password has been breached, appeared in any breach or not. So this password breach component uses have I been pawned APIs. And if you supply the password, it will go check the password on have I been pawned and can tell you how many times it has appeared in a data breach. Rest assured, it doesn't really send your actual password. It hashes the password and sends only partial hash information to the have I been pawned uh, you know, uh, server. And there is a whole bunch of articles uh, explaining and proving that this is secure. It will not basically uh, allow anyone to infer what password you are using. So it should be okay. All right, so let me, let me just switch uh, my presentation here. Okay, so uh, right. So this is a small demo. Uh, right. So this is a MySQL uh, client which has connected to the server, uh, which doesn't. It's a vanilla server. We will try to create a user now. Right now, um, this user is using a very basic password, a very insecure password, uh, but. Since there are no password validation checks installed on the server, this operation will be allowed because, uh, well, hey, uh, we didn't find anything offending with this password. So now, uh, when this user U1 is created, now let's go ahead and install the component uh, password breach check. Uh, it's as simple as executing a single statement. There you go. And once it is installed, all the password validation checks are in place, they are in force. So now, Afterwards, when you try to create a user, for example, we will now try to create uh, user U2 with similar password A, B, C, D. So now what it will do behind the scene is it will get, it will take the A, B, C, D, create Shavan hash of the password, pick out the first five characters from this hash and send it to have I been pawn to check whether this password has appeared in any data which is or not. Um, so let's see. Uh, so there you go. So it says that your password does not satisfy current policy requirement. And at the same time, if you take a look at the server's uh, error log, it will say that the, the password breach check component tried to verify the you know uh, strength of the password, and it has appeared seventy thousand four hundred thirty-five times in various password breaches. Naturally, this is not a good password. I mean, come on, if you are using ABCD, you might as well just use a blank password. So this information is printed so that, uh, you know, admin is aware of what type of passwords are being used and how many times they are appearing on data breaches, for instance. Uh, now, this is, this is just one part, right? This is just a create user. Uh, and you can actually use one of the functions which is provided by this component, which is called password breach check. Now, it is very, uh, it's it's very annoying when you know when you are trying to create a user when you are trying to change the password. Each time you receive this, okay, your password doesn't comply with policy, uh, password validation policy, blah blah blah. So, but but it doesn't give you more details. So for that, uh, enter password breach check function. So when you execute this function. Uh, it will return the value which indicates the number of times this password has appeared in the breach. So it's a clear indication to a user that you know whether they can use this password or not. So for example, if we change it to one, two, three, four, that has appeared even more. I mean, close to 1.4, 1 1.5 million times on the password breaches. Uh, let's check for some more. Let's say instead of ABCD, uh, one, two, three, four, we, we try to be a little bit more creative. You know, we try to use QWERTY, which is essentially the first character line on the on the keyboard and see how many times it has appeared. And surprise, surprise, it has appeared almost 1.9 million times. So it's not, you know, as uh, as secure as you 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 might think about. Well let's let's try a few more variations. Okay. Let's let's try uh, let's try to make it a little bit more challenging. Uh, we we now have you know we, we now try to check a password which will have uppercase lowercase uh, numbers symbols everything right 
uh, these are typical password criteria. Well, guess what? The query T1234 exclamation has appeared 165 times. So people are, I mean, even if there are password constraints, people are usually using uh, bad passwords. And of course, all this detail will appear in MySQL server log so that one can check uh, how many times a password has appeared. And it, th again, this doesn't, this doesn't really record the actual password, just the first five uh, digits of the hash or first five characters of the hash. So it's it's not revealing the actual password at all. Um, not only that, if an existing user whose password was weak to begin with, for example, the U1 we created with ABCD, if you try to use uh, another password which is even weaker, uh, it will not let you change the password because it's not uh, you know, satisfying the criteria of password validation. Now, all this information and more is available on GitHub about uh, this plugin. Uh, I have given, I mean, in my presentation, there is a reference to uh, this code. You can take a look at it, play around with it as you see fit. And it also has instruction on how you can compile, how you can install uh, this component. It works with MySQL 8.0. Um, I'll keep updating it as we go forward if there are any compatibility issues as well. So feel free to take a look, see you know how it, um, it goes. So that's all from me, folks. Uh, thank you for your time. Let me see if there are any questions I can answer.